Hi, I'm Dan Slow for the Senior Pastor at Crosswalk Church, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to the message here today. Uh, we are in the message series, Perfect Partner, and today looking at Perfect Parent. And I just want to say before we get, even get started today that this message, wow, this one applies in so many different ways. And as I've been working on it, I have just seen so many different applications. And, and I hope this comes across more today as a conversation and an encouragement for you as a parent, for you as a child in relationships. And maybe the reason why I say that just off the, the, off the start, off the bat, is uh, so many things are happening right now in my life related to parenting and children. And so, and, and they're all across the board. And one example of it is in the next 10 days or so, God willing, uh, my daughter is going to give birth to our first grandchild. And the other day, my wife was getting ready a little uh, care package to send to her. Uh, and she's, she just said, my wife said, these are things a mom is going to want to have. And my son happened to be there looking at some of those things that are kind of personal items. And uh, one thing she also sent, though, was a book, uh, What to Expect the, the First Year of Your Child's Life. And my son and my wife got in a conversation about it. And she said, yeah, I got her another book. It's What to Expect When You're Expecting. It, it goes you know, through the nine months of pregnancy and, and what's going to happen. And then this next book, What to Expect the First Year, it, it really helps you understand as a parent maybe kind of what normal is. And what I said to my wife and, and we started joking about was, where's the book, What to Expect Year Two? Where's the book, What to Expect Year Five? Where's the book, What to Expect Year 20? Uh, and, and we just laughed because that book does not exist. And when you come to parenting and, and thinking about a, a book and the rules and the guidelines of a parent, uh, I guess maybe you could look for some books out there or, or maybe you know the right Christian answer is to say, well, the Bible is my parenting book. But it's, it's difficult. So, so there's that situation with, with my daughter, my child becoming a parent and, and just wondering, have we equipped her or is it even my responsibility as a parent to give her advice on being a parent? Then, and, and fast forward a couple days, and that is an individual in the parking lot at a high school came up and started talking to me. And it's an individual that I would say probably, if, if that I think about it, was maybe a little bit arrogant that I would say in his, his Christian faith where he felt like he had all the right answers and, and uh, I think you know the type of individual maybe I'm talking about. But what was interesting is on this day he was humbled. And what was he humbled by? His high school age child who he's just like, I don't know how to get through. I, I have no idea that I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there talking to my son who's taller than I, I am. He's bigger than I am now. And I, I just feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. There's no book. There, there's no do this, do this, do that, and it's going to be okay. And even now, as, as my kids are, are older, the, the youngest, my baby is 22 years old. My oldest is going to be 30 that I'm still a parent. And even now, looking at what it is God wants from me, I just don't feel like I'm done necessarily being a parent yet. Uh, as long as I'm their dad, um, I'm going to continue to parent. And so whether you are watching today as a parent, or maybe even in someone who, who thinks, I don't know if I even want to be a parent, uh, that at least then listen to this and watch this through the eyes of a child and, and what exactly you've learned about parenting by what you've seen. Because at some point, we all are going to have to realize that when it comes to parenting, it's probably not taught as much as it's caught, meaning that, that we, we learn from what we see. We, we, we've learned it from our parents by what has happened to us. And we feel very strongly about the mistakes 
they've made that we're not going to make, or maybe things they've done well that we want to imitate. Now that having been said, when, when the question is asked, the first question, what is it that makes a perfect parent? I'm going to go back to the hymn verse that I shared last week. With the Lord begin your task. Jesus will direct it. For his aid and counsel ask, Jesus will perfect it. And so as we look at this, understanding that when it comes to parenting uh, and, and perfection that comes with it, that that is going to be something that only Jesus can bring into this relationship. And, and so it's understanding his role and our role, even in something like this, when, when we think about parenting and raising children. For our reading today, the, the start of it, we're going back to Psalm 103. Uh, and I encourage you, if you have time this week and, and you're just looking for something to read, uh, Psalm 103 is, is a page in your Bible that you're going to want to bookmark. And the reason why is Psalm 103 is, is so valuable in so many different ways. When individuals are going through difficult times, very often I will tell them, spend a month, spend 30 days in a row in, in Psalm 103, and you can do it one verse at a time. But, but it starts out this, it says, Praise the Lord, or, or bless the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. And, and I love the, that Psalm 103 starts here, because we're going to be getting into the parenting part, but it starts by showing the, the goodness and the, the greatness of our God that's shown in his love and forgiveness. And it starts us out on the right foot that, that we're, we're moving forward as forgiven children of God into this very important role that God has given us as parents. So Psalm 103 verse 13 is where we get to after this. Thanks to God, all the things that he has done, how he's forgiven us. And then the psalmist writes, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, and he remembers that we are dust. And so when you look at this, the first lesson in, in, in parenting that, that God gives us, it's compassion, and, and we can do the fill-in right away. As parents, we have compassion for our children and compassion, meaning that, that our heart breaks when their heart breaks. We care about them so much. It, it's deep inside this, this love and care we have for them in, in difficult times. So as a parent, we have compassion on our children and we understand their weaknesses. We understand their weaknesses and our own. Now, First of all, I think it's important for us to start understanding that God is our Father. We call him uh, Father, uh, Heavenly Father. Uh, I believe in God the Father, uh, maker of heaven and earth, that God is our Father. And the part of this is that just to see that he has compassion on you. So we see this first as children, that God has compassion on us. And, and why does he have compassion on us? He knows how we are formed. And he remembers that we are dust. And as you read this, I hope you start to think in your mind a little bit about Jesus coming into this world to be a human being. And in this way, it's God knows that he has compassion, knows on our, we are dust on the one hand just as our creator that he made us, he knows what we are made of, from, that when we die, uh, we are going to go back to dust. But then secondly, it takes on a whole new meaning when we look at Jesus coming into this world to be one of us. I think of Hebrews chapter 4 where it talks about Jesus as our great high priest who is like us in every way, yet without sin. And as Jesus lived this life and experienced things like hunger and thirst and cold and simply what it was like to live as a perfect the perfect God man, perfect man, perfect God in an imperfect world, that, that part of that is, is where he understands 
the weakness and the pain that we go through. But even more than that, even more than that, and, and I hope when you see the accounts of Jesus on the cross, when, when Jesus pays for our sin, understand that, that when he started to do that, he took our sin upon him. And when Jesus took our sin, understand, and I know you do, what goes along with the sin? Things like shame and guilt and embarrassment, uh, a, a wanting to, to, to pull away, all of those different emotions you have when you're caught. Um, these are things that the perfect Son of God experienced emotions that he experienced that he would not experience his whole life. And for that reason, as he looks at us, he has compassion on us because he understands our weakness. As we look at this, it's important to, when you look at yourself as a parent, understand uh, that your children, first of all, are not little adults. They're not. They, 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 although they seem like they're pretty mature for their age, uh, the reality of it is, is that a 10 year old, a 15 year old, a 20 year old, a 25 year old, a 30 year old for that matter, does not think like a 55 year old man who's gone through more. And I'll get to that in a moment. But as we look at this, we also need to understand our children's weaknesses because I'm guessing you experience those weaknesses as well. This reminds me of a, of a time when uh, there was an individual, I don't need to get into the whole story, but came down to Arizona, called me, and the reason why he called is because he was uh, in a detox place in a rehab for alcohol. And he, he was, he is an alcoholic. And uh, he was going through denial. There were medical issues with it. Just, just a horrible years and years and years and years of alcohol abuse and, and the ravages that it had on him and his marriage and, and family life. But anyways, he, we, he came down here. He and I met each week. And by the time the, that his time down here was done, he owned it, which I, I gave him a, a ton of credit for. And we, we really developed this bond and also a bond around Christ and his forgiveness for, for what he had been through. And I told him, that, and it's part of our resilient, the, the last T of resilient as an acronym is tell others what God has done for you. And I told him, I said, I hope that one day, because he was ashamed of it and he didn't necessarily want it to, to share it, and I said, I, I believe you have a great story of God's grace and how it's moved in your life. And I pray that one day that you will share it. He called me a year into his sobriety and we celebrated. He called me the second year in his sobriety and we celebrated. And then a month after that, he called me to tell me that his son went into rehab. And the only reason why I tell you that is, is, is to show, and for this dad to understand, those same demons that he battled with alcohol, his son was battling as well. And, and hopefully this taught him compassion of the weakness of his son. But even more than that, this dad now had navigated the waters of, those, of, of that addiction. And now being able to go to his son understanding that weakness firsthand and, and being able to take him a little bit by the hand and, and, and lead him out and, and show him that there is hope. That's what we're talking about. And, and so if you are a parent or if you are anything like me, it is not hard to see your insecurities and your weaknesses that your children, the demons that your children have that have come from you. The apple isn't far from the tree, doesn't fall far from the tree. And it is my prayer that as you see their weakness, it, it, it's a way that you, in your relationship with God, that he has compassion on you, that weakness you confess to him and receive strength for the, the express purpose, if nothing else, that you can help your children in their weakness and be compassionate and understanding. The next verses, 
The life of mortals is like grass. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. Now, as I'm reading these, it's like, gosh, this is kind of depressing. Especially if you look at this from a, this is about parenting. What does this have to do about parenting? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, we can do the next fill-in. And that is, as we get older, as we get older, we face mortality. It, it's just this realization that as you get older, that, that you see around you the, the effects of sin. And, and even as you look at the generations uh, ahead of you, slowly individuals losing loved ones, it, it's that reality. We face mortality. And we have a mature perspective that we have a mature perspective to share with our kids. And so as you, you begin to see this, it, it's, again, I think like a 55-year-old man who's been in the ministry for 30 years. And, and, and you can call that experience. Uh, you can call that learning. You can call that growing. And the, the good part is that now, as a parent, uh, I am able to share that with my kids. And I will tell you that there was a time when they were probably younger that they accepted all of it, that, that when they looked at me and my advice, they, they valued it very highly. Then I would argue that they went through a time probably starting around 12 to 14 years old uh, where they were sus my, my uh, perspective was suspect to them. Uh, and then probably when they got to 18 into their 20s, uh, they, that they didn't listen to me much at all. They, they didn't ask and uh, didn't want my input. And now that's starting to come back around a little bit. Now it, it's interesting. I get the phone calls. I, Dad, what do you think? How, how do you see this? And understand that you do have perspective. And, and think about this. Uh, no matter what stage of life you are at, if, if you are someone who is, you know, no matter what age you are, you have a perspective. So, so you are able to talk in perspective to a kindergartner about the difficult things that they are going through. And you can tell them, you know what, uh, you don't need to worry about this. In the grand scheme of things, when you get older, this isn't going to be that big a deal anymore. And, and so that's what we do. We, we try to help them see what is important and what's not important, and understand that that is simply a role that we have. But chances are, if your, uh, your perspective starts with, when I was a kid, it's probably not something they are going to listen to. That this isn't a competition, or, or this isn't your opportunity to say how bad you had it, and walking to school uphill both ways through snowstorms and everything like that. And I'm not saying you didn't have that. And, and I don't want to rob you of the pain of your past. But our kids live in a different reality than we grew up in. And that's just, that's just fact. And so as we look at how we share things and the perspective that we, we give them to make sure that it's in a context that they can understand and embrace. God goes on. The psalmist goes on. Psalm 103, 17 to 18. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Now, as we look at this, if we are able to give our kids perspective based on our years, or you're able to give someone perspective based on your past, do you see what's happening here? That God is saying, I am going to give you an eternal perspective, that, that I am, I'm going to take you and step back and, and see the, this, this big, big view. Because you look at your life through a lens where we have to to recognize that we are mortal, whereas God looks at this and says, I'm going to let you share in the eternal. And as we begin to, to see things from an eternal standpoint, 
even our our mortal view is so up close that that sometimes we miss this big picture. And so the the fill in here is by contrast, God is eternal, and He gives us uh, this eternal view, and His promises. His promises are the legacy we leave to our children. His promises. And I specifically didn't use the, the word word. I didn't put his word is the legacy, although that you could say that too, but his promises. That what God has to say is what we can leave that is eternal, that's going to last forever. I know we maybe think differently or maybe your family's different than mine, but I'm just going to tell you, I knew two of my great-grandparents that I met when I was very little. But if you go to great-great-grandparents, I've never even seen a picture. I've never even heard a name. Uh, that, that when you look at it, it's, you get 100 years out, 150 years out. The reality of it is that, that probably you don't know who they are and you definitely don't have a, a first-hand knowledge of them. And, and yet, when we look at this from a, uh, an Im impact of God, that we recognize that as we read the words of the Bible, we know people from 2,000 years ago. We know people from 3,000 years ago. And why is that? Because of their connection with God, who is eternal. And so, understand how God works with you. First of all, think about this as a child. This is so important. God, as your father, gives you his word and his promises laid out very clearly. And then what he lets you do is he lets you live your life. And, and as you think about that, it, in parenting, what I have noticed, my perspective is this, is, is I watch. I watch different parents and, and things like that. And there's probably in parenting a ditch on both sides of the road. The, the ditch on the one side is those who are so permissive that they never discipline their children. Um, and, it, and it would probably, they, they would see themselves as more of their child's friend than anything else. And then on the other hand, the, the ditch on the other side would probably be the, the controlling drill sergeant. You don't do anything without asking my permission. And so when you, you look at parenting, and, I, and I'll say that you take just a step back and look at it, is, is to say, do I want to learn my parenting from the way that God does it? And that is to give, give them God's word, to give them these truths, and then trust God to work through his spirit to, to move them. Now, Something I hope you have learned if you are a parent by this point, and if not, you're going to learn it. You cannot control your children. And as a matter of fact, if it is your desire to control your children, um, I'm going to argue that that, it, that might be one of the worst possible goals of a parent. And the reason why is if you look up in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is patient, love is kind, love is controlling. No, that's not on the list. That's not what love is. Love is not controlling. But other words, and, and what God does to us, are things we can do. I want to be a model for my child. I, I want them to see in me and, and of, of what I would like to see in them. And that's why before I said it's, it's not taught as much as it's caught. I'm going to teach it. I'm going to teach them God's word, but I want it caught too by, by what they see. I want, to, I want to influence them. I want to encourage them. I want to give them hope and instill in them hope. I, I, I want them to experience forgiveness and love from me and from God. And so as we talk about what makes a perfect parent, it's not to have perfect children. Get that, that really you need to understand is because any desire you have to have that is, is you're shooting for the wrong thing. That as we look at this, what do we want? We want them to share in the eternal. 
And that is why we bring them to God. We share his promises. And those promises is the legacy. It's what goes from generation to generation. And it's the way that, that our, our great, 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 great grandchildren will continue to share with us what is most important. I would like to take a little pause in this message right now. So just everybody take a breath. Okay, we, we've gone Psalm 103, and that's as much as we are, are going to look at in Psalm 103. But up to this point, everyone here has a perspective based on their past, both as a child and as a parent. And so what I would like to do right now, before we go any further, is do something that is distinctively Lutheran, uh, and that is confess our sin and receive forgiveness. Parents, I, I'd like you to start. And I, I'd like you to start by confessing your sin, first of all, to God. And I would like to, uh, you to confess specifically, and you can hit pause if you want on this message for a while to think about this because it's worth it, um, to confess to God your weaknesses as a parent and ultimately, you can confess these to your children. I wrote it down. Dear God, I confess. And to my kids, I confess that there were times I disciplined you in anger and not in love. There were days when I had a bad day and I took it out on you. There were days when you came to me and you, you wanted to talk to me and I didn't listen. There were times when maybe uh, you were going up a, a teacher or another person or whatever, and I didn't defend you. I didn't take your side. And there were things that happened in, in your life where I didn't protect you, that I was absent, whether it be because of work or just being exhausted from whatever what was going on, that I wasn't there. And now as parents, go ahead, you can add to that whatever you you want that maybe you left maybe maybe you are someone who who feels guilt over putting a child up for adoption maybe i don't know i don't know what your past is and and your your failures as a parent but understand this now and hear me as clearly as you can as a father has compassion on his children so the lord has compassion on you you are forgiven. You are forgiven by God for all of your shortcomings, for, for all of the things uh, where you have failed as a parent because you and I and all parents, we are not perfect. Next, I wanna to talk to every child here. And that's everybody then, okay? So this is everyone. And now what I want you to do is I want you to Think about how your parents, in your eyes, have sinned against you. I, I want you to, to think about the hurtful things that they've done to you, the times when maybe they've melt, made you feel unloved, they were not supportive, uh, they were mean, uh, they left, they abandoned you, they were not there for you when you needed them the most. And what I'm going to ask you to do is not hold a grudge and, and simply understand it. And, and whether or not they're apologetic for what they've done or even realized it, but I'm asking you now to forgive them, to let the blood of Jesus cover not just your sin, but their sin as well. And, and to recognize that your parents are not perfect that there, there wasn't a rule book. They're, they weren't given a manual with you. And I don't care how bad they screwed it up, that, that as you look at it, to simply say, I need to let that go. And here's why. We now go to a, a different, we're away from Psalm 103, and, and the first one is just an account of an individual who goes from unbelief to faith. But follow me here. The jailer, this is Acts 16, 
The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The reason why I do this, I shared this, is you have this jailer who is an unbeliever. I don't know what kind of dad his kids would have said that he was. But what I do see in him is at that moment where he, he is faced with this interaction with God, that he, he says, my family and my household need to be part of this. I am going to lead this. I am going to model this for them. And so th they did that as they heard the word of God, as they, he brought his family and his household uh, to the Lord through baptism and himself. And, and so this is just a, a very big deal. And it's the, the first fill in there is fathers embrace the role of spiritual leader in your life to, to understand that that is the role that God has given to you. Uh, last week, we talked about falling in behind uh, those who fall in behind Christ. That first of all, fathers, parents, and, but especially I'm talking to fathers right now, be the spiritual leader of your home. And the reason why is so important, and that is because so much more is caught than is taught. And if you are not the spiritual leader in your family, the, the, the likelihood, especially of your sons, having a close relationship with God is minimal at best. And, and understand that you are, are such an important role model uh, for your kids, especially your sons, in their relationship with God. And so to, to do that. The next passage also, it, it's, we're, we're talking now about baptism, and it's this, so in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God. So it's showing us as children, we're children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And the fill in there is this, is in baptism, we put ourselves and our families up for adoption. Think about that. We, we put our, our families up for adoption in baptism, and God does that. He puts his name on us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What that is is an adoption, God putting his name on us, and, and that is what we are. We have this adoption into God's family. Think about that for a little bit. I've already told you that I confess my sins as a, as a parent, as a father, and have been forgiven for that. But then I went the next step. And the next step was to put my children up for adoption in baptism. That, that the name of Dan Salofra is not going to bring my children to heaven, but the name of Jesus Christ is. That, that he has been brought into that family and into that relationship, which we can celebrate. Now, as you think about that, uh, I, I, and I was going through this whole adoption thing and, and talking about it, I, I happened to be listening to the radio, and it was, uh, it was Christian radio, and there was a, a woman on the radio who was adopted, and, and she was talking about just a stigma of adoption and things like that. And one of the things she said that I found, I was shocked. And, and she said, everyone in adoption is grieving. I'm like, what? I, I, I know I have family who's adopted. I, when I first heard that, I thought, I resent that. I resent that comment uh, that she would say that. And then she said, no, I, I want you to, to listen as, as someone who's in adoption. And she explained herself. And she said, first of all, that when, when there's an adoption, there are, there are grieving parents who have to put up their child for adoption. And, and as you look at that, I hope at least a part of it is, is when someone does put their child up for adoption because they, they realize they can't care for it or they can't 
be there for their child for, for whatever reason it is, there is a grieving. And understand that, that for me as a parent, when I, I bring my child to baptism, it is in some ways that grieving to say I'm not a perfect parent and my children need a perfect father. And they have one, our Heavenly Father. In a, an adoption, this woman went on to say there's a grieving child. There's a grieving child because they don't understand why their birth parents could give them up. They, they don't understand uh, what is going on and why they either, as they see it, aren't loved or whatever, however they see it. But there's this grieving of, of someone who, who finds out that they're adopted uh, at times of saying, wow, I didn't know this. And when you think about it, that's the grieving my children go through when they realize their dad's not perfect, when they realize their mom's not perfect. And I think it's especially hard sometimes for the children of pastors who, who hear preaching from their dad all of the time about the greatness and the promises of God and the desire to live that way. And then they see a person at home who is not perfect, who, who is not practicing what he preaches literally. And, and there's a mourning in that where, where we realize, and that's kids what we did before when we, when we forgave our parents. We went through a grieving process saying all those things that were done to us or the pain we experienced, yeah, that's part of it. That's part of that grieving. And then finally, the, this lady said, there's grieving even from the adopted parents. Because very often, like with her parents, they wanted to have children, natural children, if you want to call it that, but they weren't able to. And in the same way, when God adopts us into baptism, that wasn't the plan. The plan was for us to live perfectly. The, the, the plan was for us to be, you know, you go back to the garden, Adam and Eve, all of that. But what had to happen? We had to be born again. Jesus said, unless you're born again, and that being born again is the adoption that we're talking about in baptism through the sacrifice made by Jesus Christ. So again, fathers embrace that role of spiritual leader. And in baptism, we put ourselves and our families up for adoption into God's family. And, and one final thing as we talk about that, that the baptism and adoption, I hope you understand, and, and this isn't meant to be like a, a, a theological statement sermon or anything like that, but that is also why we do baptize infants. And, and we, we see that in the same way that, that you have a child that can be put up for adoption, that in baptism, that is what we do as well, sharing the promises of God and the blessings of baptism with our children at a very young age. The final words then that we look at are from Galatians 4, 6, and 7. Because you are his sons, we're adopted now, right? So that's the good part. We're in the family. Because you are his sons, because you have a perfect parent, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Wow. As we look at this, what unbelievable promises now that as we look at this, and, and, and we've covered a lot of ground today of our relationship with our parents, being a parent, being imperfect, needing forgiveness. And now where this brings us, finally, as where we end, is all back being children again. And so in the blank, you can write, God is our father and perfect parent. God is our father and perfect parent. He listens to us and offers us an inheritance. And that's what we look forward to is going to be with him one day in heaven, right? That's the eternal perspective that we have as we go through life, that, that we go through difficult times. We, we desperately need him. We need his forgiveness. But really our destiny of where we're going uh, one day when we leave this world, where we are going finally is home. So practically, what does this mean as we go back to the question, what is it that makes a perfect parent? 
it's really the, the parent who takes their child to Christ or, or brings Christ to their, their child and, and kids who, who model God's love, compassion, and forgiveness. The, the perfect family is one in which there is forgiveness. The perfect family is the one in which only Jesus brings perfection, where we have a perfect heavenly father who forgives us. And so as you go to live this truth in your life as a parent and as a child, my encouragement would be, with the Lord, begin your task. Jesus will direct it. For his aid and counsel, ask. Only Jesus will perfect it. Every morn with Jesus rise, and when day is ended, in his name, then close your eyes. Be to him commended. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, because we understand the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ, that, that we can give thanks for parents and children, uh, even with all of the scars and uh, water under the bridge, whatever you want to call it, the sins of the past, that even in spite of that, you bring us into loving relationships, you give us encouragement, uh, you, you've chosen individuals to be our parents and uh, given them the charge to, to bring us to you. We thank you that on a day like today, uh, we do hear your voice. We have your legacy, that, that we have this opportunity to join in the eternal uh, with your promises and then also look towards a future with you in heaven. Lord, help us uh, to encourage one another, for parents to encourage parents uh, moving forward and uh, just help us to continually go back to you as our heavenly father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as you go from here today, go with the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.